Okay, we're going to start things a little bit differently this morning. I'm going to have Emily come up. So go ahead and turn the piano on. I got, just do the yellow mic. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days have been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. That was awesome. Okay. Have you do something a little bit differently. Okay, you're going to do the chorus. I want you to close your eyes. You know the chorus. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to picture you just woken up from a one-year-long coma. You've just woken up, and the first face that you see is Anthony's. He's been waiting there. He's been waiting there for a year. Your dad and your mom are sitting there. Your dad's asleep because that's what he would be doing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, so your dad and your mom are there. Your brothers and sisters are all there in the room with you. And you've just woken up from the coma. And your dad says, okay, I want you to sing the chorus to goodness of God. Okay? I'd probably yell at him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Close your eyes. Okay. It's all my life you have been faithful. Come on, feel it. It's all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. So my life you have been faithful and so my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able oh I will see of the goodness of God oh I'm gonna see of the goodness of God. So what's the difference? What makes the difference between the first time she sang it and the second time she sang it? The first time she knew what she was singing. She sung the song a hundred times. She knew what she was singing. The second time she knew why she was singing it. So what is the difference between what and why? You're a parent, when you're a parent of, of small children, one of the most annoying questions that you can be asked is why. What is the easy question? What are we doing, Mom? We're cleaning our room, because that's what we do. You know, and she says, why? Why do I have to clean my room? <sighs> because we, Why? Why? And you get these incessant whys until you finally, out of frustration, say, because I said so. Because I said so. I'm the mom. I said so. And that's why. So I was watching a movie recently. That's a powerful movie, but I'm not going to give it away. I'm just going to give away this one scene. This one character, these two main characters, one of the characters looks at the other one and says, why are you doing this? And the one character goes, because it's the right thing to do. He goes, no, I don't buy it. You quit your job. You left your wife and your family. And you're risking your life. Why are you doing this? And he gave him the answer. And he says, OK, I'm in. Now that I understand why you're doing it, I'm behind you 100%.
and I will go wherever you go because I understand why you're doing it. So this all started with me. When somebody said, your homework assignment tonight is to watch a YouTube video. There's a, a YouTube video from a guy named Simon Sinek. It is actually a TED Talk, if you know what those are. So this TED Talk, Simon Sinek goes, start with why. And primarily the purpose of the talk is that every good business, every major business, and the names that he goes through and names that you would understand, is able to articulate why they do the business the way that they do the business. Whereas one company will say, this is what we do. And you go and say, eh, I don't get it. Another company that can, that can articulate their vision, why do we do what we do? Then that's the company that you're going to get behind and say, I, I, can, I can get behind that company. I can get behind your vision. I use that word vision. Vision is kind of interesting because a lot of times I thought of vision as this is what we do. That's part of vision. Part of vision is this is what we do. But a greater part of vision is this is why we do what we do. Proverbs 29.18. Go ahead and bring that up. I think this is King James. says, where there is no vision, the people perish heard that for years. Where there's no vision, the people perish. And then I read the NIV. Where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. I'm like, isn't restraint a good thing? Why is casting off restraint a bad thing? But I kind of like the way the, the Passion Translation says it. Where there is no clear prophetic vision, people quin quickly wander astray. If you don't know why you're going where you're going, then every little bump in the road is going to stop you. Every little bump in the road is going to derail you. When I was, um, for those of you who don't know, in 2016, we received a call in our life to, to that after I retire, I'm gonna move, we're going to move to Honduras and we're going to become full-time missionaries in Honduras. Didn't share that with anybody. I shared it with two other people, my wife and Pastor Eric, and they're both in Africa right now. So shared it with two, with two people, and that's all. I mean, for years, I didn't share it. Now I've shared it with so many people that I, I told Lauren a couple weeks ago, I said, you know, there's no getting out of this. We have to go now. <laughs> there's no backing out. So now, the year after I received, or just actually about eight months after I, re, we, I received the calling, we received the calling, I was in Honduras, and I was driving a car with a friend of mine, really good friend of mine, and he said, you know, most missionaries, I hadn't told him anything, most missionaries who move to Honduras don't last a year. They come, they come, and they, they say, okay, I want to, I want to give my life to the mission field. I want to go to the mission field. And they go to the mission field, and they have no idea why. Well, because God called me. That will go until you hit a bump in the road, because when you hit a bump in the road, you're going to get the same question that Eve got in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say that? Maybe he said, maybe he meant this. Maybe he meant you're going to give money to the mission field. Maybe you're going to get that. If your why isn't big enough, then any bump in the road is going to derail you. Any bump in the road is just going to wipe you out. You're going to hit a bump in the road like, like oh, my goodness. Um, I, just heard, I, I just heard yesterday that um, David Langland has had malaria like 15 times, and he got up to preach yesterday. Like, that would be the kind of bump in the road that would derail me. It would just say, say, well, maybe God hasn't called me to a place where I can get malaria. Well, no, if you really believe why God has called you to where he's called you, then you're going to say, I guess I'm preaching with, with malaria today. It's not going to stop you. It's going to keep you going because you know the why. So 
I can tell you this stuff, and it's going to make a really good TED Talk. I can say that people, um, that people who don't have a clear prophetic vision will quickly cast off restraint, will quickly go astray. I tell you that, and you're like, oh, that's interesting. That's really good. But if I don't show you something in the Word, so I'm like, God, show me in the Word where somebody changed their why. That's kind of a weird question because it doesn't actually say that in the Word. It doesn't have a clear example. And then he gave me one. I'm like, wow, that's a clear example. So this is kind of my, the theme. People will not be inspired by what you do if they don't know why you're doing it. You ask people to come alongside um, and get behind your vision, and they have no idea why you're doing it. So they're not going to, you know, we're, we're talking about raising support for the mission field. People aren't going to, people aren't going to support us unless they know why we're moving to Honduras. And I can tell them what we're going to do, but if I can't tell them why they're going to do it, they're going to like, okay, you're, that's another mission, missionary who's gone to Honduras. I've got to be able to articulate why we're doing it. So the Ark of the Covenant, writer, if you could bring up that picture. This is a rendition, an artist's rendition of the Ark of the Covenant. We don't really know exactly what it looks like because after Indiana Jones found it, they put it in a warehouse somewhere. <laughs> but we know things like, well, I can tell you, those bars are wood. They're not metal. They're wooden bars. It was very specific what God said, the way he said he wanted cherubim on the top of that with their angels out or their um, wings outstretched. He goes, and that's where I'm going to meet you. That's where I'm going to download. That's where you're going to get the download. That's where I'm going to tell you the precepts is that, that spot between the, between the angels' wings. So the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of the Lord. In uh, 1 Samuel chapter 4, it talks about Israel had gone out to battle against the Philistines, and they weren't doing really well. So somebody gets the brilliant idea, let's bring out the Ark of the Covenant because it represents the presence of the Lord. So if the presence of the Lord is with us, then we'll win the battle. And they bring out the Ark of the Covenant. Let me tell you something. The presence of the Lord is not a good luck charm. It did not go well for them. And they lost the Ark of the Covenant. Now, for them, it had really, the whole thing about the presence of the Lord, obviously, was not that important to them. That's why they brought it out into the battle that they had no business being in. They didn't ask God if we should go to battle against the Philistines. So they bring the Ark of the Covenant out. And the Ark of the Covenant gets, um, gets captured. And so the Philistines, they get this idea, we're going we're gonna to just take it. It's a cool god. It's a graven image, you know. It's just like, so we're going to put it alongside all the other gods that we have. And so they put it in a warehouse, and, and um, they set it down. And every day they would come back, and it would fall. Their other gods would just fall over. And it's like, Okay, this isn't going well for us. And I mean, there were, there were things physically that happened to them. They're like, this is not good. We cannot handle the presence of the Lord. And so this is something. So they put it on a cart, and they sent it off. They put it on a cart with some cows, which cows aren't exactly motivated to draw cars, uh, carts. I'm not sure how they got it to, to go, but it went. And it went, and it stayed in the house of a guy named Abinadab for 20 years. 20 years, it stayed in Abinadab's house. Till David becomes king. David becomes king and said, what are we doing without the Ark of the Covenant? We're the chosen people. We should get the Ark of the Covenant back. So he sends out 30,000 people to Abinadab's house. 30,000. And they knock on the door, and they, they get it out, and they put it on a new cart, Brand new cart, because we're going to honor the Ark of the Covenant. They put it on a new cart, and they sent it out, and we're going to go back to Jerusalem, and we're going to go praising and worshiping. 2 Samuel chapter 6. says, when they came to the threshing floor at Nacon, Uzzah, 
Abinadab's son, reached out his hand and took hold of the ark because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. God struck him down, and he died there before, beside the ark of God. So he reached out his hand. God reached out his hand. Uzzah didn't fare well. They actually called that place Perez Uzzah. Perez is, is one of the, it's a cool word um, in Hebrew. It really means breakthrough. So basically what they were saying is that God broke through Uzzah. Uzzah wasn't just struck down. He was broken through. Hit a bump in the road. If you had asked David, and I'm sure people did, David, what were you thinking? Why did you think it was a good idea to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem? Because obviously, it was a mistake. Obviously, it was a mistake because as soon as it hit a bump in the road, it stopped. And everything stopped. David would have said, because Jerusalem is where the presence of the Lord belongs. That makes sense, right? Because it's mine. I'm the king of Israel. The Ark of the Covenant's mine. It belongs where I say it belongs because I'm the king of Israel. That's why. Until you hit a bump in the road. You hit a bump in the road, you stop. And they put it in the house of Obed-Edom for about three months. Can you imagine being Obed-Edom's, obed Eben edoms you got to get it, Obed-Edom. Can you imagine being his family? His wife's like, why do we have that thing in our house? They were probably really quiet because we don't want to talk loud. We don't want to say anything wrong because we don't know when God's anger is going to burn against us. So children, you behave around the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> so three months goes by. David says, that's it. So in those three months, God really blessed the house of Obed-Edom, really blessed him. And David's like, now he's jealous. I was, okay. Now ask David why. <sighs> because I've seen what kind of blessings come with the presence of the Lord. And I'm tired of living without the presence of the Lord. I'm tired of it. His frustration now has grown to say, I'm going to do anything, even if it means researching how to bring an Ark of the Covenant back, how to carry it around. Because there were very specific instructions how to carry the Ark of the Covenant around. And it was not a new cart. It wasn't being pulled by calves. It was being carried by descendants of Levi. It was very specific. It's going to be carried on the shoulders of the people of the descendants of Levi. There was no ambiguity in there. This is how you carry it, because it represents the presence of the Lord, and that's an important thing. That's a powerful thing. So David's like, I will do whatever it takes, because I'm not living one more day without the presence of the, God, of the Lord in this place. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. It's a different why. That's a why that when your wife says, look how foolish you are, she'll like, say, I don't care. I want the presence of the Lord. I don't care what I look like. I don't care what it looks like. Can you imagine telling this, these priests now, you're going to go carry the ark. Last person who did that, last person who touched that died. And you want me? Okay, consecrate yourself. Consecrate yourself to the Lord. But he died. He was cut in half by a bolt of lightning. That's kind of what I picture, is that a bolt of lightning came and he was cut in half. He was broken through. David goes, I don't care. I don't care. I'm not going to live one more day without the presence of the Lord. It's a different why. That will get you over the obstacles. My first mission trip, because I always said, I'll never be a missionary. 
Never tell God, I'm not going to be this. Because there are two things that I swore I would never be. A computer programmer and a missionary. So after 30 years in computer programming, I'm going to be a full-time missionary. But I've done, I think it's 12 mission trips, short-term mission trips. Russia, Kazakhstan, Kenya, and Honduras. Um, which reminds me, um, and I, I see Nadia here today, um, Russian, the Russian language has two words for why. There's pachimu, which is why, and zachem. So you can ask somebody why, and then turn around in the next sentence and ask them zachem. For what reason? Like, there's the why, and then there's the why. I don't, I, I don't get it. Why? What's the real reason? What's the real reason you want to do this? Zachem. For what purpose? And then you'll get the answer and say, okay, I get it now. I'm in. So my first mission trip was to Kazakhstan in 1993. I was going with the team. We had this all planned out. It's a whole... Um, we were a Southern, I was in a Southern Baptist church. It was a whole thing sponsored by the Southern Baptist Convention. And we're going to fly into the capital city, which at that time they didn't really know what the name of the capital city was. Either it was Alma Ata or Almaty. Depends on who you ask. If you asked a Russian, it was Alma Ata. If you asked a Kazakh, it was Almaty. Um, and so we were going to fly in there and then going to get on, on a bus and go to a little village and deliver humanitarian aid, 13 of us. And they give me a call about a week before we're supposed to leave, and they said, the visas didn't come through. Kazakhstan at the time was, it was coming out from underneath. Um, they got their independence from Russia in 91. And so you had a real uh, Muslim... Um, uh, Ethnicity, not really a religion, but it was more the ethnic history of Kazakhstan was rising up. And so they wouldn't approve our visas. And they call me up and they say, our visas aren't approved. And I'm like, that's just wrong. No, that can't be right. I said, I told them, because we're all supposed to meet as a team at JFK Airport. People coming from all over the country are supposed to meet as a team at JFK Airport. And I said, listen, I live two hours from the airport. Call me. Just give me two. I'll have my bags packed. Just give me two hours notice, and I'll be there ready to go. And they say, well, that's just not going to happen, Mr. Hammond. It's just, you know. They call me on Friday. They said, our visas got approved. Can you still meet? We're going to meet on Monday morning. I said, I can be, I'll be there. I find out on Friday. On Monday, I'm there. The mission had totally changed. Now we were working in a Christian school outside of the capital city. And just out of curiosity, because now the team has come from 13 down to 9, and I end up asking the other eight people, I said, so why are you here? They said, oh, because I told them I was going no matter what. The other four or five people, that answer, your visas didn't get approved, was enough to derail them. It was a bump in the road. They couldn't get past it. I said, I'm going no matter what. Without a why, you will not be able to inspire people to follow you. If your why isn't big enough, any obstacle will derail you. If your why is big enough, it will get you over any bump in the road. Let me give you one. Why do you go to church? Because I like the people there. Yeah, the first time somebody offends you, you won't like the people anymore. Bump in the road, you'll stop going. Why do you go to church? Because the Bible says that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Hebrews 10, 24, I think. 
yeah, okay, the government's come out and said, you can't have more than 10 people in a building. Is that why going to get you over the hump? Is it going to derail you? It did. There are some churches that have not recovered from COVID. Have not recovered. Have, there are some churches that closed their doors and they have not been able to reopen them. Because their why isn't big enough. Why do I go to church? I go to church because I need to be in church. I go to church because I feed off from the fellowship that I have with you all. I go to church because there's something that happens in corporate worship that doesn't happen when I worship by myself. There is something different. That's my why for coming to church. And it's, it might not be the same for you, but it works for me, and it gets me here every time, almost every time the doors are open. It feels funny. It feels strange for me not to go to church on Sunday. It's totally because my why is big enough to where, oh, man, if I'm on vacation, I mean... It's really kind of cool. My wife is watching us right now from Tanzania. Now, it's probably because she likes me, I hope. <laughs> I love you, honey. My grandkids are watching, and my granddaughter wondered if the guy playing the guitar with a flat hat was, was their papa. Like, no, he, you know, they're, they look kind of alike because they're, they're close to in the same age, but no, papa doesn't play guitar. But I'm at the point now where you can't tell me. I don't want to say this because you might try, but there is nothing you can do to derail me from coming to church. You know, when uh, Jesus was with his disciples, he said some stuff and, and most of the disciples left. And he, Jesus looked at his disciples and said, are you going to go too? And he said, where else would we go? You've got the words of life. <laughs> that, that was their why. Because there's life here, and I'm drawing from the life, and that's my why for coming to church, too. There is life here, and I get to draw from that life. I get to draw from the knowledge of the, of the other people who get up here and preach. I get to draw from the worship, even if I'm the worship leader. I get to draw from that, and that gives me life, and it gives me hope, and it gives me joy. And that's why I come to church. And you can't derail me from that. Here's one. Why do you tithe? So, if your why for why you tithe is because the Bible says that if you don't tithe, you're robbing God. That's a good why. And that used to be my why from a long time, for a long time. And I would sit there and I would write out all of my bills and then I would write out my tithe check. And sometimes there was enough and sometimes there wasn't. And then I remember we were in Panda Hugs. So this goes back. Some of you can remember Panda Hugs. We were in Panda Hugs and the engine blows out of my car. I need a new engine. Actually, I could have had the engine re repaired and it would have been $2,800 or I could have the engine replaced and it would have been $24. I guess I'm getting a new engine. Those are the kind of whys that will derail you giving to the Lord if your why is because of Malachi 3 or because God loves a cheerful giver. Now if you ask me why, I will say, because I've seen what my finances are like when I had the other why. I've seen when my why wasn't big enough to give, I saw what my finances were like and they were a mess. And now that I've dedicated and said, okay, the first thing out of my check before I even come to church, because if I come to church, that's like three or four days that, that my money has been in my account. It can't stay in there that long because I know me. And my why is too big right now. My why is too big because I know what my finances are like if God's not in control of them. That's why I tithe. Yours might be totally different. Okay, let's look at things a little bit different way. I have no idea how long this is going to take. So Sometimes you have to ask yourself why. 
And it's not a good why, it's a bad why. Psalm chapter 42, verse 4 says, These things I remember as I pour out my soul. I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the, of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Man, I used to be on fire. You couldn't drag my butt away from church. I, and when I came into church, I was the one singing and dancing and shouting and jumping. I used to be. Why, my soul, verse 5, are you so downcast? Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for yet I will praise him, my Savior and my God. Why did you let things change? a different why. It's a why that you've got to, you hit a bump. Maybe you hit a bump and you were going along great and you hit a bump and now you've got to ask yourself, why? Why do I struggle with depression? Why do I struggle with anxiety? Why do I struggle with sickness? Because I used to be the one. Hmm. I'll give you one. I used to be the guy, and I'm just being totally honest with you, I used to be the guy who would sit and say, divorce is a sin. God hates divorce. And I was adamant about that. And people in my church who were divorced, didn't want to, or who were separated, they don't want to talk to me. Because I would be the one, God hates divorce, divorce is a sin. Until I got divorced. And I found out why God hates divorce. And it changed the way that I spoke to people. Because God hates divorce because it rips people's hearts out. It will, it will grab, because the thing is, the two have become one flesh, right? So that when you have a divorce, you have a... A, a spiritual, emotional separation of this heart, and you hear the term brokenhearted. No, this is, this is ripped-hearted. And that's why God hates divorce, because he sees people who don't recover from that, they don't recover from that misery, and that's why God hates divorce. He hates what it does to people. It kind of changed the way I spoke to divorced people. It changed the way I spoke to people who are going through a separation. Because I can still say God hates divorce, but now I know why. Now I know why God hates divorce. Verse 6 says, My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar, I will sit there and I will remember everything that you've done in my life that I, that I can grab a hold of and say, that's my why. That's why I was rejoicing. That's why I will grab a hold of everything that I can grab a hold of to turn my soul around. Because I used to be this, now I'm not, but there's a reason I was like that and there's a reason I'm not. Let me change my why. I'm going to change it. You've got the power within yourself to change your why. Deep calls to deep. This is deep stuff. I'm not, and it's really strange because this is a little bit different message because I'm not going to give you an answer today. I can't. Your why is something that you've got to work out and make it big. Make it big. Are you okay with a waterfall? Are you okay, are, are you okay with the deep calling to deep and the roar of the waterfall where you almost can't hear anything else? It's overwhelming. Some of us need to be overwhelmed. 
Some of us need to get to that place in our life where, okay, I've let some other noise in, and it's not good. I've let some other distractions in. Maybe you didn't hear the voice of God. Maybe you didn't hear clearly. Maybe you've hit some bumps in the road. Maybe you've, you've just, maybe some people have hurt you. Maybe, maybe you've had a sickness or maybe there's something relationally that has just kept you away for a while or kept you out of fellowship or kept you from, from really just diving in and saying, I'm going. I'm, I, whatever you want me to do, God, I'm in. You need a big why. You need to get over the bump in the road. Loring and I have a pretty big why. And for those of you who don't know what we're doing, um, as I mentioned earlier, in 2016, God gave us a call on, on our life that, that after I retire, we're going to move to Honduras. The first why was, the first picture was that I was going to teach worship leaders. That's a good why. But it wasn't big enough. For one thing, Lauren's like, okay, you're teaching worship leaders. What am I going to do? I don't know what I'm going to do. So why? So lately, what we have really been, been feeling, and this is just, just to be honest with you, is that, that there is a level of supernatural ministry that we're supposed to be operating in when we get there. Honestly, that seems huge for me. It was really kind of cool. We were, uh, we're out in Colorado, and we had the awesome opportunity to sit down with Pastor Sarah's mom for a couple of hours. Awesome, awesome lady. And um, just to let you know, Pastor Sarah's dad operated in, in supernatural ministry for a long time. And it was, it was cool because you came in and I just get this picture of him like grabbing you and praying for you. And it was just, it was awesome. It was like you felt the, the power of the Lord. We've really felt lately that that's going to be a huge part of our ministry. And it has to be a huge part of our why. Why are we going? Because they're starved for supernatural. They're starved for signs and wonders. They don't see, they don't have the opportunity to see the kind of things that we see in America. And I'll tell you something, we don't have the opportunity to see the kind of things we need to see in America. A lot of times we don't put the... the that emphasis on supernatural ministry because we've got doctors everywhere. You know, if you're depressed, go to the doctor. If you're sick, go to the doctor. If you're, and, you know, I'm not saying anything against doctors. I love doctors. But I was on a medical mission in Honduras, and the guy, a guy came out, and when he comes to me, he's done with the doctor. He's like, yeah, I've got pain in my back, and they gave me some pain medicine. Okay, I said, can I pray for you? Now, this is something that they don't do. They pray for somebody who's sick for them to be healed, but they don't operate in the healing itself. They operate, they just, they send them on their way and say, okay, I prayed for you, that's my job. No, not according to the Bible. It's praying and speaking and laying on of hands and anointing with oil. There's a lot of stuff that's, that's our responsibility. So I prayed for him. He goes, wow. He goes, that feels good. He's, I said, pain gone? He goes, yes. Well, it's something that I'm, I'm not saying anything about the other counselors that were there, but they did not operate in supernatural, supernatural ministry. And I'm talking about ministry of the Holy Spirit, whether it's natural, supernatural, whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do. That's con that has become a very big part of our why. 
Well, now why? We got to learn, we got to operate in this. We got to do this. We got to be ready. We got to hit the ground running when we get there. So, yeah, I leaned over to learning about three weeks ago. We're in Colorado, three or four weeks ago now, and I said, we need a bigger why. We need a bigger why. The whole teaching worship leaders and, and we're, gonna, we're just going to go because we feel God wants us to go. Yeah, because God said so. That's a pretty good why. But it won't get you over the bumps in the road. So what's your why? What is your why? It's something, like I said, I can't answer for you. You have to answer it for yourself. You've got to be the one who says, okay, this is my why. Why do I give? Why do I tithe? Why do I go to church? Now, I'm assuming that because you all are here listening to me and not Pastor Eric, that you've got a pretty good why. Why are you going to church? But when the government comes, comes out and says, no, only 10 people can be in a room at a time, what are you going to do? And I'm not saying, uh, you know, don't get me wrong. I was one of the 10 people in, in here. I get it. They were arresting people in Tampa, in Hillsborough County, because they had too many people in their church service. Yeah. Yep. So I get it. But, you know, they arrest pastors in China all the time. But their why is big enough to keep them going. Their why is big enough to where they hit a bump in the road. What is your why? And it better be a big one.